We're gonna have a series of panelists with us and we're gonna carry on uh, for the next hour or so in conversation and mutual learning. Aaron and Kita, I'll turn it over to you and I'll work behind the scenes to make sure that all the panelists are with us. Awesome, thank you so, so much, Anna. Um, and thank you all so much for being here. What an incredible, incredible morning we've had already. Um, and I'm just so excited for this next piece. Um, my name is Gita Marotra and I'm a faculty member um, at the School of Social Work at Portland State University. I use she, her pronouns, and I am currently working um, with my colleague, Erin Fairchild, who will introduce herself in a moment, um, with Trauma-Informed Oregon to look at the intersections of trauma-informed care and racial justice. Um, so we know that these are both um, critical areas of our work, um, and to date, they haven't been in a lot of explicit conversation with each other. So some of what we're trying to do is do a little bit of a deeper dive into what those connections are. As we're moving into the panel discussion today, we're going to be focusing on mutual aid. And thinking about what we heard from Dr. Pinder Hughes already today, mutual aid is a critical component of building beloved community. It's a critical component of building intergenerational relationships and is central to the reconnection and re restoration of our communities. Mutual aid is a solidi solidarity support a solidarity-based support system in which communities take responsibility for caring for each other. Some of the assumptions of mutual aid are that communities are experts on their own experiences, that communities have always had strategies, both informal and formal, to meet their own needs. And this time of COVID and multiple pandemics that we've been living in have shown us yet again the significance and the power of mutual aid in our state, in our communities. And we are so delighted to have such amazing panelists here today to share their brilliance, to share their work um, and what their work has looked like in this time. Um, in a few minutes, you'll get to hear um, who is actually here on the panel, but I just wanna name that we have a range of types of groups and organizations that are here today. Um, some of the folks are representing groups that are established nonprofit organizations that have been around for some time, whereas others are more informal uh, community groups or networks that have come up really in response to the recent pandemics. So we'll hear kind of a range of perspectives of mutual aid from those different vantage points. And Erin, I want to turn it over to you. Hi everyone, thanks for being here, welcome. Um, again, I just have to extend my thanks to Dr. Pinder Hughes and Trauma Informed Oregon, to Mandy and Anna and to all of you for attending, for just creating this space to be together and think about all of these incredible intersections and be inspired to just continue to grow in our work together. Um, my name is Erin Fairchild, my pronouns are she and hers. Um, I come from a background of working at the intersections of trauma informed care, violence prevention and intervention and challenging white supremacy in myself, within my networks and within systems that I work. Um, I am a consultant to Trauma-Informed Oregon, partnering with Gita and the project that she described. And ultimately I am so honored to be here with all of you today. Um, I have been following, Gita and I both, as many of you have, have been following the amazing work that's been happening um, during this difficult time in our community. Um, and it just, it just really is breathtaking to see how um, communities take care of each other. And um, we know that some of your organizations and groups like Gita had hinted at um, do different kinds of work in the community. So we want to acknowledge the breadth of the work that you do. But today we are focusing intentionally on mutual aid. Um, after we have the honor of learning from groups and organizations that are implementing direct mutual aid, we're also honored to hear from the expertise of Dolly England from Oregon Health Authority, who is a funder and partner in this work. Um, we do ask that you hold your questions that you may have for all of our panelists today and take them back with you to ponder. We're not going to be having, having a Q&A um, session with our panelists, just given the time restraints and wanting to give them an abundance of time to, to go deep. Um, and then for our common from care champions in the audience, there are many, hi, um, we invite you to listen deeply and return to your work with a commitment to reflect on 
and synthesize in the wisdom that you've learned today and, and to really think about how we integrate this into our ever evolving frameworks for trauma-informed practice. They're always growing and changing and living as they should be. Um, it is our work to challenge the dominant paradigms and assumptions that exist within our systems, particularly challenging how the assumptions of whiteness and really supremacy thinking of all kinds show up in our work um, as we expand what trauma-informed can and should mean. And so with that, we are going to get to know a little bit from our panelists and I'll pass it back to Gita. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so to start with, we would love to hear from each of the panelists. So if you could share um, just an introduction, your name, the pronouns that you use, the organization or group that you work with, um, a little bit about the work that you do, the type of mutual aid that you're engaged with, and anything you'd like to share about how you're resourced in terms of money, people power, et cetera. And anybody can start, but we would love to hear from all of the panelists on this question. AJ, are you willing to start? Hey, yeah, I'm willing to start. Hi, my name is AJ McCrary. I am one of the co-founders and executive director of Equitable Giving Circle, um, which is a new nonprofit that is Black women-led, um, Black femme-led, and Indigenous women-led. I'm also one of the co-founders and am part of the leadership team of Mom Block, which is a Black woman-led uh, mutual aid group that is serving the Portland community. Um, my, uh, let's see, I'll talk mostly about EGC because Jamie's here to talk about Mom Block, but I am lucky enough to be part of both groups and get to work with an incredible amount of organizers and just dope ass women. Um, EGC is a nonprofit that is, oh, and my pronouns are she, they. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, EGC is a, we started off as a mutual aid group, um, we are a giving circle. We are collecting dollars from the community and making impact with them. And our impact is twofold. So we are one, um, directly supporting the black and brown economy here in Portland. Um, and we are also doing direct community care. Our work right now is mostly surrounded, um, surrounding food. So we feed 528 families, uh, black and brown families across around the Portland area um, every single week with direct food delivered to their homes. Um, and once a month, we also support these same households with protein as much as we can. And as soon as we get a warehouse, we'll be able to also increase our monthly, our weekly protein, or not protein, uh, pantry items. Um, so we are really focused on getting black and brown families healthy food um, and also food that is closer to their first food. So first foods are things that we would be eating as individuals if we had not been colonized. And so different communities around the world typically eat different stuff and it's having the right foods that are most aligned with your body is really important for your health. Um, so like with our proteins, we make sure that households are getting the proteins that they actually want to need. If it is um, a household that is halal or kosher, we are happy to get them the appropriate things and work with them to get the items purchased from the right places. We work with a lot of different indigenous <clears throat> families and um, quite a few indigenous families in this area only eat fish or salmon, um, sometimes white fish as well. And so we make sure that we are buying one, from indigenous farmers, and two, getting our indigenous families food that they actually want and will eat. Um, hopefully this year we'll also be able to start adding bison into the items that we're able to get indigenous families and families in general. Um, a lot of families would like access to bison because it's a really healthy protein. Um, and it's pretty amazing. If you haven't had it, you should definitely try some. Um, we also do, we have a housing initiative that we did. We got about $200,000 out into the community supporting over 50 households um, with three months mortgage and rent relief. And this is really important because housing is a right and housing secures families into being stable, keeps their kids in the same schools, it keeps them accessing to whatever community they have been participating in. Um, 
And we do this all no strings attached. We also have various other initiatives that we're working on. Um, we have a joy box initiative that we're gonna be doing twice a year where we got families um, just kind of, we did it for New Year's and we're gonna do another one for Juneteenth where we are just getting people like cheerful things. Um, we send out blankets and games, some healthy snack items, self-care items. Um, for families just to just have a nice little something and we did it as a new year's thing and so it was like non just like not any particular religion or holiday new year's is something that's pretty uh most folks celebrate um it's part of our calendar year and it's really important that we're really respectful to people and their different um, cultures and communities um we have a bunch of other little small projects. We do the plant thing, the plant jam, where we're getting plants out to the people. We collect plants from the community as a practice in reparations. Um, white folks and white businesses bring plants to Cafe Reina, and then EGC works to get those plants out to the community. Um, it's really important that we practice that reparations when we're talking about that as a term, because a lot of people have no experience or negative experiences with reparations. Um, just hearing about it, like that it'll be something that takes away from them when in fact, it's getting us back to a giving model that has been taken away from us globally because of colonial norms and colonization. Um, so that's the kind of the stuff that we do. Um, and we're growing right now. So trying to feed more families and deepen our partnerships with the various communities and other organizations that we get to work with. Um, our work is all community minded and community based. And it's really important in just not just taking care of people with physical needs that we're also taking care of the economy. To date, we put over $800,000 into the black and brown economy locally from buying our produce from black farmers and indigenous folks <clears throat> and also doing some small initiatives around um, with the black businesses here in town. So we have a curated box program. Um, in November, we got like $20,000 just into small businesses for that. And we're doing it again this coming month. So lots of stuff that we're doing again, both around community care and the economy, because a lot of times this work seems to leave that part out. And the long-term benefits of investing in the black and brown economy means that we are really moving towards black liberation and sovereignty. Um, and you know, not just black sovereignty, but indigenous sovereignty and also including every other POC person that we can along the way. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna go and I'm just gonna ask people in order of how I see you on my screen. Um, Daisy? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, uh, very happy to be here with you all this um, morning. It's still morning. Happy Monday. Uh, my name is Daisy Bedoya Sotelo, and I use pronouns she, hers, ella. I'm the organizing director at Begun, Oregon's Latinx Farm Worker Union. Uh, we work directly with farm workers and our Latinx working families. Um, I specifically oversee the outreach that is done in labor camps, agricultural work, um, and other areas where our Latinx community uh, comes together. Uh, currently, we are working uh, in educating uh, our communities around COVID-19 and its effects. Uh, also starting to uh, prepare uh, individuals for the vaccine that is coming, doing a lot of education work around that. And uh, we do a lot of uh, PPE distribution, but also wrap around references and services. Uh, community uh, really comes uh, and looks to us for any references such as financial aid, uh, housing. Sometimes we are also helping folks uh, get into um, really uh, childcare or get into housing, right? So we do a lot of wraparound uh, services uh, that my department offers. Um, and also uh, during, uh, as you all know, 2020 was a very hard year. We had the wildfires that happened um, and we had to pivot or PPE distribution into a wildfire response, which uh, really meant uh, working with a lot of organizations, working with the community to ensure that uh, our, our community members had their basic needs met, such as food, uh, blankets, um, and then also financial assistance, right? A lot of the folks had to leave their homes and find a place uh, to make sure that they were safe. But also around this time, we saw that, I mean, the pandemic is still happening, right? So a lot of folks were going to live with their families and we uh, were working with them to ensure that uh, we, we could help them move out or um, if they were there that they got the financial assistance that they needed because 
they were exposed to COVID um, at the end of the day, right? The more people that congregated, the more uh, we unfortunately it, it spreads. And so that's what that's the work uh, that we do. Uh, but also, uh, we during this time of uh, of the pandemic, we uh, launched a um, Pecun emergency fund. And so we were able to help a lot of people with financial assistance, but also we were part of uh, the quarantine fund. Um, um, who started all of that um, ALA fund for folks who are undocumented and don't necessarily qualify for the stimulus checks. So our organization was uh, one of the ones that advocated for this, and we were able to help a lot of people up to date. Um, as far as uh, how we source all of our staff, well, a lot of donations that come from our community, a lot of volunteers uh, that also are willing to step up and help us during big distribution days. Um, I'll tell you all that the wildfire distribution was uh, very intense. Um, it was, uh, I think it's not secret that we were all running around, <laughs> uh, but it was uh, such a beautiful thing to be able to help over 600 people during that month and during that period. Um, and so very uh, grateful for all of the work that was done, but we wouldn't have been able to do it without the help of all the volunteers that showed up in our offices, um, all of the chefs and the businesses who donated food to make sure that our, our volunteers had something to eat and we had the energy to keep going. So um, shout out to, to definitely all of those uh, folks who are helping. Um, and then we also have a lot of donations from uh, just community overall, right? Folks who believe in our work, in the work that we're doing, uh, people who are also uh, out of state uh, and also believe in our work. So a lot of donations came from all over the state, all over uh, really the country. Um, and very grateful for them. And I'm happy to be here with you all and share more about our learning experiences um, and definitely what to do and what not to do <laughs> when you were pivoting into uh, emergency um, emergency cases in this in this situation situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy. Jason, I, mean, I get pumped up hearing these type of words come out of people's mouths. Uh, my name is Biggie. I'm a member of Will Bridey. I'm also the founder of Fires Igniting the Spirit Fits. Um, so where does it start? So I guess my pronouns are sacred, they, him, he. Um, I don't I don't say that in conversations, by the way. I just do that to honor you guys because you asked me. Um, and I forget the other parts of the conversation here. Somebody keeps typing on the bottom. Uh, if you could just share about your organ about your organization, um, a little bit about what you've been doing um, in terms of mutual aid work and how you're resourced. Okay. So, so FIT started out as a program that was going to help um, fill a gap in the community here in Portland to help people that are transitioning from treatment, prison, or relocating from reservations to the city. Um, so we had issues about doing it. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I saw that need and I cared. Um, I operate with the system um, that I learned out of White Bison called Wellbriety. It means to be well and be sober. Um, it's a native uh, indigenous based teachings of 12 step recovery. Um, it also includes reconnecting with the culture because growing up in America, cultures are, are destroyed. Um, and so I, we've had this going for like the last two years and it wasn't until last March um, that we started to um, get requests from White Bison to help the Navajo Diné people down south with PPE masks. And I didn't know how to ask people. I didn't know how to ask for help. I don't know how to sew. But then I started to find out that there's like hundreds of these little Facebook groups that their whole job is to sew. Like they sew everything. And I reached out and I made the request and we got like 500 masks right away. And I was able to mail those out to this motorcycle club this nonprofit or whatever, I'm not sure what they classify as, whatever we got to do to jump through the white supremacist system, we, I guess we have to do. Um, and so they, they were doing the distribution themselves on their bikes in the communities there. And that was my first taste of what it means to ask outside of my own people for help. Um, and after that, we started to, I started to look around me and say, well, wait a minute. I'm in Rolled Warm Springs. What about my Yakima people? 
Um, and when I contacted people, family, friends, and I started to learn that no help was coming for my people. No help, not even from tribal governments because tribal governments were prepared for stuff like this. And I don't wanna say that they weren't thinking about it, but at the same time, there was no actions. And so right away, I felt that conflict um, and I leaned into it. And um, I started real small. I started asking for help on a COVID-19 Facebook page and a woman named Leela Brown, a white woman, um, who I know from my time in Standing Rock, um, you know, cause I was, I wasn't getting anywhere. Nobody was hearing me. It felt like I was still invisible. I still feel like that, by the way. Um, and when this woman got on there and rewrote what I said with my, with my flyers, the response was huge. So it took this white woman who gave a shit to get my voice to be heard. So that right there started me on a path of not only understanding that my existence is a form of resistance still in the eyes of people that want to help, but I have to keep. I have to still keep fighting, and by my actions is a form of way I fight. I no longer do that. You know, you know, my whole life I've been a part of the system: foster care, group homes, prison, and recovery, not only from drugs and alcohol, but American culture. And so I understand what was happening. I was being overlooked. Whatever. Who the hell is this guy? He's a scam. Those are the thoughts I was getting. So I knew, so I knew getting into this work, it wasn't going to be easy. But when it took off, it took off and it's still been going. Um, I never knew what mutual aid was. It was a, it was not a common word that I would use for my life or my community. We don't know what that feels like, but I do now. EGC hooked me up with some food boxes from Unio's Farms. I don't know if that's you. But we get a food box every week of veggies and fruit, and I love the pears, so I'm eating those now. So I, I started to feel like what, would it, what it was for people to give a shit about um, Native community. And that um, the direction I wanted to go was to get a bunch of stuff and give it away to my people. That's what mutual aid is to me, I think. Just get a bunch of monetary, money, food, hygiene, household supplies, and give it away to my people. So we, we hooked up with Westcat, Warm Springs Community Action Team and Warm Springs. And then we hooked up with Peacekeeper Society in Yakima. And I started to learn that um, there is such a thing as outsiders of these inner communities on reservations. Whether we come from their tribes or not, there's still such a thing as outsiders. And mistrust is still big in my community. Um, I started to learn that in order to help these communities get the help they need so they didn't leave the reservation to go to Walmart or Safeway or Fred Myers, that we were able to bring some kind of supplies so that they didn't have to leave the reservation to bring that COVID back. That became the vision. That became a part of the whole vision of teaching this city that you're still on indigenous lands. Your community, Lentz, Lowerhurst, Albina, all these little neighborhood associations that sit on their pedestals, they're on indigenous lands. They have to be taught that that community in Warm Springs is the same community you oversee. Where did we forget about that? The education system, the, poli the political systems, the colleges, the elementaries, the high schools. Where did we forget to teach each other to be human? To look at each other and really acknowledge Instead of saying out loud, like, like we're in a stage play of what a land acknowledgement is, really acknowledge that they need water, they need food, they need stable, stable housing, they need security. No more land acknowledgements without actions. That's what we're teaching. Really look at people for who they are, what they are. They're just like you. They might sing songs and beat on heartbeats, but we're just the same. We watch Grey's Anatomy, Stranger Things. We do the same things. We know how to love, right? But we, we have so much stuff heavy in our minds that we create these barriers, these blocks, these insecurities that keep us from asking for help, accepting help because we mistrust the systems that are in place. Because every system has a white person looking right at you and asking you shit. Like they don't understand where you come from. Like they don't know how to help you. They know how to go home and help their kids and their man or their woman. But they look at you and ask you, what do you need? 
Well, I need you to sign this shit. I need you to go to this class. No. Human rights should just be, yes, we got you. We'll help you figure it out. It's coming. Because there's work happening in that unseen spirit world that we don't understand and we can't see, but it's happening for us. The spirits are with us in our work. That's the only way it keeps going because we've created something sacred. So now Fitz helps multi-reservations as far as the Dakotas. We just got back from South Dakota and I heard Pendergrass, uh, I want to say professor, but I could be wrong. Um, I heard that elder speaking and he was talking about the Lakota reservations and you know, um, they still operate in no way, matriarchal systems. There's still some misogyny and patriarchal shit going on there. That's what Christianity brought. Catholics brought that shit. But when you help those, when you help those people, those leaders within those communities, you start to help create an example. You start to build that trust with that, with that leader, that elder who wants to help her community. And so I use the same formula of helping the people on these other reservations by getting in contact with people who give a shit about helping the people they don't have anything. And so it's it's been it's been a ride of up and downs. Um, so how we receive funds is um, Venmo and PayPal. That's it. We we've been given I think four grants because we don't have an MOU signed with Don't Shoot PDX. We haven't been able to see, receive those grants. There was $70,000 in grants and I haven't been able to access it. So I've been operating just on community power, just by word of mouth, building relationships. Right now, currently, Snackbox, the only organization that helps me, they offer a thousand bucks a week until their money runs out. And that money goes directly to Warm Springs, Yakima, Chiloquin, Montana, South Dakota, whatever, wherever we go next, that's where that money goes. And I have a storage unit here in Portland that the city of Portland um, was kind enough to let me use because for a long time I was looking for a warehouse space to house all this stuff. Like I, we were getting over like a quarter million dollars in like donations and where the hell are you going to put all that? You can't get it out fast enough. That was during the fires. That was crazy. It was, it was, uh, you felt the need and you put aside your feelings and emotions. You breathed in that, that thick smoke that gave you headaches and made you feel uncomfortable and you just handled it. And now I didn't share a lot of the experiences some other people may have ex experienced with these white supremacist groups that were a part of that. And they were pointing the finger and saying people and Tifa was up here lighting fires and shit. I didn't experience that. Uh, we hooked up with the Oregon Child Development Association in Ashland. And we made a couple runs there to help her, um, help her community. And that's how the relationships are built is we, we talk to the people in these communities and we validate, you know, their visions for their communities because you know, when we have women leaders, those are the people that we have to just say, how can we help? What can we do? How do we do it? Is it okay if we do it this way? Well, hey, I'm going to drop you all this. Is that okay? So a lot of times asking for permission because I'm a big dude and I know I can be scary and I don't mean to be, but you know what? I In this way of life, being straightforward and getting it done is, has been like my priority. And I'm going to look at you, right? And you're going to look at me and Majority of the time, people see each other right, you know, but when I go out into the world, I'm kind of scary, you know, and I don't mean to be, and that's something I carry is a lot of the times is that when I'm with somebody else, they usually defer to the other person, which happened to me on Facebook. They deferred to the white woman other than the Indian, you know, and that, that hurt, that hurt for like a day or two, and my insecurities popped in, and so I know what it means to be invisible. I know what it means not to get help. But all that started to change as this process was growing. As I was growing with this work, I started to, to, to believe that, you know what, if I ever needed help, it would come. And I've been fortunate enough, my woman works at 2 on one and so I've never had to struggle like a lot of people. She works full time at 2 on one and she pays the rent. And I've been focusing all my work and all the money that we get to go out to our people. And so I create my own hours. That's one of the other cool things about me, Jill Aid, is I create my own hours. I get out there, I get out there every day doing something, you know, and next we're going to um, Colville. And so during the fires, we hooked up with River Warrior Society in Colville. And we hooked up with the group that, that gives a shit about their community. And when I say that, I say that when I, with, the, with, with the mind that, you know, tribal governments didn't react. 
OHA had to hand out millions for something to happen. I didn't see none of those millions, but I was, I was aware. Like, okay, maybe my workload will get less, but you know what? I'm gonna keep going. And that's crazy, man. Like, when I heard buffalo and salmon, there's deer out there, elk out there. There's all kinds of food out there. Our people don't know how to react to a pandemic crisis. We don't know how to react. Jason, but I sit with you guys. No one, I understand. I sit with people who give a shit. You know, and I just updated my flyers on my IG. If you can share it, donate, share. I'd appreciate it. Thank you guys for listening to me. Thank you so much, Jason. I also just wanted to call out that Anna has been putting in the chat links to all of the organizations um, that are represented here on the panel. So that's another resource for you all as you go back into your communities to stay connected to the work of these organizations that are doing such critical, critical work in our communities. And Jamie. Hi, um, first I wanna apologize, I have a cold. So <laughs> I, might, I might be blowing my nose often, but I am here. Um, I'm here representing MomBlock. My name's Jamie, uh, my pronouns are she and hers. I get the um, great uh, opportunity to work with AJ often on mom block stuff. Um, she's my she's my sister in this mission. We started mom block just last summer. It kind of came out of the wall of moms um, kind of momentum that had some challenges. <laughs> I'll just say it like that. And um, some of us leaders were like, well, we're not done doing the work yet. What can we do? And there's about 10 of us that, you know, black moms that were like, we need to, we need to keep fighting. We need to keep going. We, need, we have work to do. And I think we started a very intentional um, idea of mutual aid, but we wanted it also uh, rooted in education and um, advocacy. So we started out very slow, almost just uh, providing education about what we wanted to do in terms of mutual aid, what it, what it is to be, um, to put black voices first, how to center black voices. And then we eased into working at some direct action events, um, got our name out there. And I think our biggest um, like introduction to the community was during the wildfires when um, PPS, who I actually work for the district, decided to not, uh, they couldn't feed children one day because of the fire. So we came together with some folks that work at other nonprofits and we pulled together um, a food drive, monetary donations, and we fed about 500 families, five, five to 600 families um, over one weekend. And that got on the news and got us some press. And um, ever since, since then we've done a um, uh, Thanksgiving drive for, gift for food boxes and gift cards. And at Christmas, we did actually just straight cash because we decided as we went along in this process, kind of like what AJ talked about, there's no need to um, give people the food that we think they need. People should be able to buy the food that they want to eat. Um, everything from cultural to diet restrictions, there's no, I mean, get the food you want. And it feels so much better to shop for food yourself than it does to get a food box. Um, I grew up as the kid that had to get the food box and then had the different color lunch tickets because I was on free and reduced lunch. So there's a lot of stigma behind accepting food and we wanted to break that. And so we um, we have people email us usually um, anonymously. You don't have to throw your name out there. We don't need to know. We don't need everyone to know your situation, We but we are here for you. So that's kind of how we've morphed into um, I guess what we are today. Our current initiative, we are working with the Portland Association of Teachers, the union, to do a winter coat drive. And um, the distribution event is this weekend. Um, and we have about 400 or 500 coats to give out to uh, Portland family members, adults and kids. We are still, um, for Black History Month, uh, a few of us have some great ideas for education and um, also along with that advocating for our black and indigenous youth and um, Latin Latinx youth over around um, testing and returning to school amongst the pandemic when we don't feel it's safe for our community yet. So we're definitely gonna get some um, advocacy pushes out. We're going to do things like um, example, like letter examples, who to write, how to write, how to advocate for yourself, how to use your voice. We definitely wanna start focusing a lot more on education, but we will always have our mutual aid component um, right now, we 
primarily receive donations from the community, everything from like tangible donations like food, coats, to um, f uh, financial donations in forms of gift cards, or we have a Venmo and a PayPal and a Cash App. Uh, we are looking to get a fiscal sponsor so that we can make it a little easier to accept donations and we can accept larger amounts because um, we've, we've grown enough that now we're like, okay, we kind of have to have to take the next step. Um, we don't necessarily know if we want to be a nonprofit yet because we're so young, but we definitely do know we need some help fiscally. So we're looking into that. Um, but we are um, still a group strong of, um, of eight to 10 black moms who are just taking the initiative to, to get out there and um, care for our community. We kind of figured nobody can take care of us like we can take care of us. We know what we need. We know how to provide it and we know who to get it to. Um, and I think one of our funnest initiatives we do is on our Facebook group every week, we do Wish Wednesday. And you could be in the worst possible mood and wake up on Wednesday and you can look at our group and people are helping each other and gifting each other things. And it warms your heart, even if you're having a bad day. So that's my favorite um, initiative that we do every Wednesday. Sometimes we forget to post it at 8 a.m. But as soon as it posts, we, we are, um, we're hit up and people are excited to, I think people are even more excited to gift than they are to ask. Um, and I think we are also trying to break the stigma of asking for help. There's, you don't have to provide a story and proof and receipts. We just just say, hey, I need help. Or, you know, and if you all you really want is a pepperoni pizza, because that's all you really need in life right now, just ask for it. <laughs> you never know, someone will treat you to that pizza. So uh, that's how we're, that's where we're at right now. I think um, soon you'll start to see some of our bigger initiatives over the year, but right now it's the coat drive and um, education and advocacy, especially around Black History Month. We really want to, um, you know, throw out. We also like to uh, boost other nonprofits, other Black nonprofits. So I think we have some ideas too of also like linking, partnering with people and um, letting them do posts on our page. We uh, we think big, so hopefully we can we can get there because we we like to dream big. Thank you all so much. It's it's so inspiring and beautiful to hear even just a little snapshot of your work. I wish that we had the power to unmute and just like have everyone screaming and hollering and cheering and clapping because what you all um, ha are describing is truly phenomenal and I see it coming through in the comments. Um, I'm really, really struck by that idea of what happens when um, who needs to get out of the way gets out of the way so that community can take care of itself and um, all of those structures of white supremacy that pre prevent that direct like you get to say and do what you need with the resources that we have to give you so um, thank you for those overviews I think everyone yeah okay so our next question um, is what inspires you to do this work why mutual aid what um, what's kind of, what's the inspiration that keeps you going to do it? And I think we'll just go back in the order that we started, if that's okay with everyone. So I'll pass that to AJ, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, it was really great to hear from everybody. Um, and I, I've gotten to work with you guys um, and be in community with you in different spaces. So it's happy to see you again here. Um, what inspires me is the community. I've had to personally rely on the community a lot to survive as just a single mom and just my own personal background. And it's a way to give back. One of my, our board members at EGC described the work that we do as a love language. And that has struck with me since she said it. That's Roche Burns, who is one of the directors over at Growing Gardens. And um, I also say like, children and the fact that we're doing this work for generations that don't exist. Um, like I don't consider the work that I do personally my work. It is, I'm carrying the torch right now um, of generations of people, of activists, of educators, of prophets, of just amazing individuals from uh, generations before me. Um, and I'm carrying it now to give to generations that don't exist. So right now I'm just a go-between. Um, and that's what keeps me going. Um, I also say that like seeing the change in real time, I think for a long time in my work, um, I didn't get to see change that was in like 
impact or change that was instantaneous. And that was really hard. Um, and now we're getting to start to see and feel the impact in real time. Um, and like, it makes it easier to do. Like the work that we do, all of us here is really hard. Um, but getting to see that impact and getting to see like, we are making really cha big changes and getting to see even from a year ago, how these conversations were going to now has been changed a lot. And so that's for me is what is really inspiring. Um, and also too, now, like I don't have to work with white folks like that anymore, to be honest, like that shit's exhausting and really hard and miserable. Um, and getting to carve out space in the Pacific Northwest to be, um, you know, in a black led, indigenous led team um, and in, in partnership with, you know, black and brown led organizations and, um, you know, businesses is really inspiring. I've lived in the South and lived away from this community. I went to um, school at Xavier University, which is an HBCU. And to come back up here in such a whitewashed place where I grew up um, and where there just isn't enough people, like, there is a lot of black and brown people. We are just not given the opportunity to lead here um, and to be in, in control of our own resources. And so like to get to be a part of that shift, even right now, it feels kind of small, is really empowering. Thank you, AJ. Um, our next uh, panelist here from is Daisy with PCUN. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah, uh, that's a, a very, uh, Big question, I think, right? Uh, but you know, um, I think that what really inspires me is the undocumented um, community uh, that lives here in the United States. Uh, they're constantly being left in the shadows. And I also come from a household of farm workers. Uh, I grew up seeing the disparities in my community firsthand. Um, I am a first generation student, so I had to go through all of that, uh, the struggle and the disparities. Um, and I think that's really what inspired me. You know, I went to college and, and I really learned that, that it's not me, right? That it's the systems that were put into place prior to even me being born. Um, that that's why we're having to do all of this work. And I think uh, just growing up uh, with really um, a whole lot of other Latinos, like I wasn't, I always felt like I, I belong, right? It wasn't until I went to college when it really hit me and I was like, well, wow, like I'm really not wanted here, right? Like. I, I, I am a, a person of color and um, although I don't belong in these spaces, right, of, um, of education, um, I am here. And so it's, it's a lot of the resistance that my community has had. Um, everyone who has come before me definitely inspires me because I am uh, here because of them. I, I am in their shoulders uh, because of them, all, all my ancestors that have fought this uh, way before I did, right, and, and truly, uh, just just uh, the community that we're helping, right? Um, I mean, I, I said it earlier, but it has very, been very inspiring um, and heartbreaking at the same time to see how farm workers are um, in the lines really uh, working so that we have food on our tables along with other, uh, other, uh, other people of color, other individuals from our BIPOC communities. And they're always being left behind in the shadows. And it's it's so heartbreaking to see that, but so inspiring to see that they're resistant, that they're not stopping, that they have they want to keep going. And truly they have to keep going, right? Because we don't really have a choice to sit at home and say, I don't want to go to work today. I have to go to work today, not only to provide for my family, but also my community. And uh, truly the big impact that we have in the academy as, as people of color. Um, has been really inspiring and the work that I've been doing lately um, just just really speaks to that right like seeing that regardless of where we come from there is hope and that people are willing to step up when there is um, like a pandemic or when there are wildfires the amount of help that or my community received during the wildfires was wow like heartbreaking uh, not heartbreaking it was very inspiring sorry uh, our whole uh, little building was like filled with things. And it was just so inspiring to see that really in times of need, community can truly come together regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our religion, regardless of anything. And, and it's truly inspiring to see that. So I think that's really what inspires me, but ultimately 
the, the community that is constantly left behind in the shadows that still continues to do the work every single day for us and for the rest of our communities is what really um, really speaks to me every single day when I wake up in the morning. And, and I say, you know, I am going to work, but there's a lot of other people who are going to work who have not been uh, been given the opportunity to do this work, but also who are uh, just in the shadows and being left behind without any other help, but the help of our organizations or help of other people who are willing to help, just like everyone else who is here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy. So now I'll pass it to Jason with Fires Igniting the Spirit. Okay, I was thinking. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking really deep past a lot of what I've said. Um, and I feel like death, um, death has been this inspiration. Uh, we're talking about George Floyd. Um, we're talking about the whole BLM movement. And we're talking about my ancestors, um, the grandmothers, the kids, uh, the whole genocide. And I feel like death plays a part in inspiring me to do this work because, you know, when I first started, my uncle Leland, um, he's a part of the tribal government in Yakima. He was in a coma and he caught the COVID-19 virus at a gas station. Um, and he was wearing all his PPE, gloves, face mask. He was washing his hands, but he still caught it. And death was very close to him. They, they had to transport him lifelike on a bigger machine, the breathing machine, and they had to induce a coma so that his body could heal. And he lost over 100 pounds um, during that fight. And um, I think what kept me going, um, what kept that fire alive was that, you know, I was losing people. I was losing people that were culture carriers, that were language carriers. These were grandmothers that was teaching her community the language that's, that, you know, there's a, um, there's a big fear about it disappearing for good. Um, and so that's, that, I think that was a lot of my motivation to keep going was that um, when I looked around, I didn't see a lot of other people helping the people on the reservations. Um, and that wasn't like my main focus. It was like subconsciously right here that like a calling, like a spirit led calling to just do this work. It was always right there. Um, and it became sacred for my life. It just came my life. And uh, I think that I mean, whenever we can prevent death and we can, we can um, give life to life, like food, you know, shampoo to wash your hair and soap to wash your ass, you know, we're promoting life. So there's a polarity to that, right? There's, there's always a polarity in everything we do and all the interconnected things that we have in our lives. There's always going to be a polarity good and bad and I know that um we live we're living through a time of great grief struggle fear um but I think that you know the people that are called to do this work they understand that but they answer that call um and they get out there and they do it regardless of a pandemic and so they put their lives on the line that in itself is living on the edge you know you might catch that Rona you know you might catch that COVID-19 and be stuck but that's what we do. You know, we put ourselves on the line to help people survive. Um, and I never really think of it this way, but you guys had me thinking about that question. What the hell does inspire me? And I knew that in the beginning, it was death. Death inspired me and I didn't want to see any more death because people were, were leaving us. The creator was taking them. They're gone. And uh, I think that's it, yeah. Thank you, Jason. Um, Jamie from Mom Block. Oh, and if you're speaking, Jamie, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I don't know if it's inspiration as much as um, you just do what you have to do. <laughs> like your community needs you, you answer the call and you go. It's like your community puts out the bat signal and you go show up. Um, and there's been times that we've been tired and there's a group of eight of us and we joke we're like the Wu-Tang of mutual aid because there's so many of us <laughs> and there's personalities and there's different wants and needs, but we all end up coming together to do what we need to do. Um, and so it's hard to say because uh, inspiration, 
I guess comes from those like when you smile because you help someone and you see them smile and they're so rewarded. And um, what I love about it is my kids are all in there. They're sorting coats with me and they're coming and handing out food and they're making um, donations and deliveries and they got to be Santa Claus at Christmas and drop off a bunch of gift cards and, and they're in it too. And they don't necessarily think it's something they have to do like a chore. It's just what you do. Like this is what we do when our people need us. And I think that's what is one thing about our group is we didn't necessarily set out to um, even turn into what, we, what we've turned into. I think it was more of a, let's see how this rolls. And then it rolled out and we keep finding ways to help people and uh, people reach out to us now. And we do all we can to make sure that people are covered. I mean, we helped a mom over the weekend that had some needs for funds. And we said, hey, we can't provide all of it. Maybe we'll throw out that a mom needs funds. And within an hour, we had um, a match like of, you know, the amount of money we needed. And people are appreciative of what we're doing for the community. And I think that that's helpful, that that helps, but that's not why we do it. We just, I mean, even if no one cared <laughs> and there was no press or we weren't invited to do these things, we'd still be doing it because it needs to be done. Thank you, Jamie. Doing it because it needs to be done. Yep. Um, I feel that. So I'm going to pass our next, I think, yeah, Gita with the next question. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. AJ, did you, were you raising your hand? No. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, thank you all so much. I think it's it's interesting to think about inspiration when so much of what I hear from you all is a deep calling. Like just you're responding to the need that you see and it's values aligned and it's connected to the things that you care about. But so much of it is about being called to respond. Um, and it's just really powerful to hear your reflections on that. So thinking about all of the work that you do, what have been some of the lessons learned in regard to the work that you're engaged with? And we don't necessarily have to go like around in the same way. I think, um, especially in the interest of time, we might not be able to hear from every person for every question for the last few. So just anybody who feels called to answer that, some of the lessons learned in regard to your work? One lesson I think we've learned in Mom Block is we have to reach, we have to find, there are a lot of white people who want to help. We have to find the right, the white people who want to help for the right, right, the right reason. That's hard to say, white people for the right. Um, and it's it's hard to suss out, but we've kind of got, a, got our system and we, we, we always have to make it clear that we're ahead of the initiative and we need white accomplices. We don't need anyone to take over what we're doing. We want you here to help. And I think as we've progressed and done some more events and some more initiatives, people figured that out. And um, sometimes we do need people to lead different aspects of it and we'll ask, but we, we uh, I think finding the right accomplices and partners is essential to mutual aid work because um, you don't want them to take over and you also don't need dead weight, really. I mean, <laughs> it's hard enough work and we don't need to, to drag anyone along. Just go on your own way if you're not helpful. So that's one thing we've learned. Find the right help. Yeah, I'd say in addition to the definitely finding the right help, also that not all money is good money. Um, a lot of time in this work, people think that because they're offering something, um, it's good. Like I was just offered an opportunity and they wanted me to shop this around to other nonprofits. First of all, it's illegal. You're moving money. Um, and second of all, it's an opportunity for you to siphon data from black and brown and marginalized people and get them to use your service in the guise of um, funding good work. And this is like a one of the small opportunities or one of the small examples of like money not being, um, you know, all money is not good money, but calling it out and, and getting really comfortable in that. That's like something that I've had to really, really learn. Like before in the similar work that I've done, I haven't had to be so forceful or um, loud about like, this is wrong or like, this is, like I haven't been the, 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 the final person to say something. And now in a position where I'm, you know, part of leadership teams, um, it is my response. Like, I can't just be like, somebody else is for sure gonna say it or mention it. Um, and that, you know, is, it has been a really interesting balance. Um, and a lot of people aren't comfortable with saying that all money is not good money and like saying no and rejecting stuff. Like we get into a, 
these um, habits where we allow other people to have the power in a relationship or a, in a partnership or a dynamic. And it often does not have the best interest of black and brown people of, or just of marginalized people in general, like the oppressed are always not put first. And so learning how to really um, make that shift and be just loud and unapologetic that like, I'm not gonna back down about that has been, has been a really big lesson over the last couple of months. Um, just how to navigate that and how to hold space for it and to not, to not be timid. Um, and cause we've had with EGC, um, so we have government contracts and we have funding from the community and some grants. So we have kind of a variety of ways that we're being funded. Um, the community support is ideal cause unrestricted funds are the best um, really. But to be able to, um, you know, to like, to just shift these conversations, our conversation with the city who, in a, one of our grant contracts or our, just our contracts, uh, that first COVID money, it was really inequitable and just a problem. Like you want me to spend five to 10 hours every single week to write reports of literally the same information. They were shocked when I was like, absolutely not. I'm not giving you the money back. I'm gonna give you one report of the same information all at the very end when I get to it, bye. And that was it and they were shocked. Um, and I'll continue to do that. Um, we're going to continue to try to take, you know, work with government money because that is the people's money, but these power dynamics and really shifting them has been a really big learning curve. Dang. You guys said all I wanted to say. White people get out the way. Um, so I, I, uh, I've, I've felt ex exploitive uh, intentions in my work uh, with native and non-native. Um, I see a lot of personal business owners wanting to get in on this work. And I had one white dude in Gladstone who said, I got these 50,000 masks that I want to give to the tribe, but I need to be there to make sure they go to somebody who I can trust. And I looked at him. And I didn't react. I didn't react angry, but I looked at him and I knew that this dude is in it for some other reason other than the help. And I felt a lot of that with the a lot of these white organizations or white people is that they have their underlying uh, agendas um, that I they don't align. They don't align with my mission, my vision. They don't align with my people. And so I I learned how to cut ties and keep moving forward. Um, and I make it really simple about how they can help, and that's it. And I don't have any expectations. I don't ask people where this Venmo money's coming from. I just say thanks. You know, just we get this right out. Um, so I, I, um, I feel like a lot of the times when I go and I do this, that you know, I don't pay attention to who's watching. I don't pay attention to who's paying attention. I don't know a lot of the people that help. Um, I just know that I show transparency with what I buy and the loads that we buy. We usually do an acuity impactful load of toilet paper, paper towels, cleaners, household supplies, anything you can think of in your house right now, um, we get to them. And, you know, sometimes our biggest load was 40,000 bucks to the Nimi Poo people. And so I learned that um, moderating how much we give each load will help with the sustaining of actually helping multiple communities because the money comes and it goes that fast. Um, and I don't know when it's coming um, because I don't have a 501c3 yet. And I feel like I don't have to do a 501c3 to get to where I want to go, but I do because I have to operate within those systems to get the SAMHSA grants, the OHA grants, to get funding for recovery work that I do with my native community here in Portland. Um, and so I feel obligated to to do that. And so I kept all my receipts. Got $100,000 in receipts that's buried in my account. And I hope I don't get effed over for it um, by the IRS. And I don't have a problem saying that. I was on an interview with Kamal Bell and he, and I said that on, on his recording and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> IRS is going to see that. <laughs> that. That's, oh, that was another cool thing is that, you know, we were given attention 
during these protests about how natives felt and how we responded and how we related to our black brothers and sisters. And I grew up in North Portland when it was North Portland, not when it is now. People riding bikes everywhere, drinking paps, blue ribbon and coffee shops in the morning, walking their dog. But anyway, that's all nice. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just that, you know, all of us were moved out of um, our homes and I, I have a dream of moving back there to my, my home area, my, my old neighborhood. Um, and I don't know where I was going with that. I lost it talking about shit that's not related. Um, and so I, I learned that, um, we live in a time of change and I'm not going to try to answer or understand what that means yet. I just know that if I keep leading with my heart and keep praying and keep singing my songs, and burning my medicines and I pray and I know that things will be okay and I'll do the best I can. Um, I don't have, I have a lot of support, but I don't have a lot of employees. I'll be hiring when I get some money. I'll hire white people. A few of them. Some of them guys are smart. <laughs> no? Okay. No, because we have people in our community, black and brown, about, indigenous and otherwise, who have the skills that you need. Who need? What about jobs? the Irish? What about the Irish? <laughs> I don't know anything about the Irish. You know, I, I I do believe in the coming together time, and I believe that natives have a lot to teach these these uh, colonizers about this land and you know, the way to live on this land. That there are values and natural laws that come with this land, um, and so I do believe in the red, yellow, black, and white. And I do believe that each individual decides if they belong. Um, and so I know I'm, I'm racist, but at the same time, I understand. Well, I guess not racist, just I'm not angry anymore. Um, I'm defensive, I'm protective. You know, I protect, protect people when, they, when I see them being exploited, I say something. But I do believe that we are living in a coming together time where we do have to do this together in some way, shape or form that helps it so that we can keep doing it without hurting each other. And I think that means re-educating these white systems to how to live with these lands. That means, you know, your degrees mean nothing if you don't know how to live on this land. You're, you're whatever. I'm not saying you didn't earn that shit. I'm just saying that if you don't know how to live with this land and you're one of these colonized people, you're part of the problem. If you voted for that white woman and Ted Wheeler and not Teresa Rayford, you're part of the problem. You know I don't support politics, but I wanted to see a, a, a woman that would bring change in the systems we have to operate in. This is what we got for now. We're not going to raise an army and say, do this or else. Our army is different now. It's a spiritual warfare. That's what I believe. And that's what I've learned through all this is that I'm going to be affected in all forms of interactions in this community. I'm going to be affected. I'm going to be touched weird in my mind and my heart. But I don't go out there that much anymore since I did this work because I don't want to catch that shit. I don't want to bring it to my people. But yeah, white people do exploit. They're still doing their thing. But we know. We watch you. We watch you a lot. Daisy, did you want to add anything before we move on just about any lessons learned in the work that you all have been doing? Yeah, I think just two quick points. Um, you know, I think in times of just emergency work, it's super important to be able to pivot, right? Uh, when the wildfires uh, were happening, we saw a lot of um, information going out, but for us, it was just going out in English. And that was such a, a, a turning point where we had to do um, a lot of translation and interpretation for our communities um, and also indigenous languages, because a lot of the times it's just in English. And uh, what happens to the, the individuals that don't speak, don't speak it, right? They speak Spanish, that speak other languages. Um, and so I think that that's very important when we're doing this work to acknowledge that there are other languages aside from English um, and be able to also help people that way. Uh, so I think that was one of the biggest uh, things that, that we learned. We had to step up and, um, and really translate documents and uh, put social media out in, in other languages so that folks would know that, that there was an 
emergency and that literally the wildfires were happening to two towns or a town down the road, right? So, um, and it puts also people in danger when uh, this information is not getting to them. Uh, so just being able to pivot in, in really all of the other, um, uh, and all of the other information, but also like thinking about the older generations who don't necessarily have Facebook, who do not necessarily have Instagram or social media. How do we get this information to them so that they're also safe? Um, and does that mean sending letters? Does that mean, you know, actually building that relationship and connecting with them so we can give them a call and say, hey, you need to get out of your house right now because literally there is a fire coming and it's not safe for you. So really understanding that, um, that there is specifically right now with COVID, right? Uh, we've all talked about Zoom. I mean, we're in a, Zoom, in a Zoom setting right now, but what happens with all of the other individuals who don't have access to the internet, don't have access to a smartphone, or don't have access to other things. So really thinking about how we can get this information to um, individuals who don't have access uh, to the internet or uh, the language itself. Thank you all so much. I mean, I feel like the lessons learned question kind of implies that we learn all the lessons and then we're done. And kind of the reality is like this work is so complex and it's always growing and changing and evolving based on the context and the needs of our communities. But I'm so struck by across all of your answers, like how much work it is to navigate these white supremacist, patriarchal, colonized systems that we're all in. So even as you're trying to do this mutual aid work, it's such a navigation of that, you know, figuring out the right allies, figuring out what money can, you know, can be trusted, figuring out all of these pieces is a huge part of the work. And I think we often don't name that that is some of the labor that we do um, in trying to do mutual aid work um, in these contexts. And, you know, I think that is one of the questions that we are really sitting with and investigating in our project with Trauma-Informed Oregon is looking at the truth that organizations really can't, and, and communities and spaces can't call themselves trauma-informed if they're not actively anti-racist, and particularly really focusing on rooting out anti-Blackness and anti-Indigenous um, strategies and ways of being in the world. So that sort of is the bridge that um, we're looking at today when we think about trauma-informed practice um, and, and hearing about the power of mutual aid and what happens when um, the people who need to get out of the way get out of the way. So I just, you know, we wanted to thank you all, just such a heartfelt thank you, um, you know, honestly for your time today, but also for just all that you've been doing to hold down in our communities. Um, it has been incredible to watch. Um, it's always been happening and to see it flourish now has been um, a really a guiding light. Um, so we're going to pass it now on to Mandy um, Davis with Trauma Informed Oregon. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Applauding, applauding, applauding for our panelists and your work. Um, Mandy and and Dolly England from um, OHA from Oregon Health Authority are going to reflect on the power of mutual aid and trauma-informed care, kind of from a funder perspective, Dolly England and Oregon Health Authority um, have been a critical partner in making this work happen and providing funding. Um, and Dolly, we'll, we'll let you all introduce yourselves, but Dolly is the Community Engagement Program Manager at Oregon Health Authority in the Public Health Division. Um, and in passing off to Mandy and then Dolly, we just wanna offer our sincere gratitude as well to Oregon Health Authority for funding some of the work that we just had the amazing opportunity and benefit to learn from. So thank you, blessings and all your work. Thank you all. Uh, as a white person, I'll work on making sure we get out of the way, Jason. I'm, I'm hearing your words and your dog is very cute and getting lots of uh, noticing in the chat box. Um, we, you know, we have about 20 minutes and Dolly, I think what I'd like to do is, you know, I want to open up to the conversation. You know, I, um, I have some, uh, some experiences and so the idea is like, how are we doing this work differently? How are we learning from this work of mutual aid that is absolutely fits the principles of trauma-informed care? And so I want, to, I want Dolly to speak to some of the work OHA has been doing. I know Portland State University, I've pushed and nudged different policies and procedures um, to get things out the door in different ways. And, and so I wanted to be able to have this, this conversation come together that way too. So Dolly, do you wanna introduce yourself and the, amazing, the kind of the work that you and your team stepped up rather quickly for our State Department? <laughs> yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dolly England, pronouns she, her, queen. 
and I am the Community Engagement Program Manager for the Oregon Health Authority. Um, and as Mandy mentioned, it, um, it is something that happened very quickly. And so I think first thing to note is that I was uplifted within this organization. Um, I started off working in the reproductive health program and then um, in March got the call to please help with the COVID response. And um, between March and May, I was helping to support community partner phone calls um, with information about COVID, we'd have senior health advisors on um, to talk about whatever community had questions about. Um, and then we got some federal dollars um, to fight the COVID um, pandemic. And I was asked to help create a grant and stand up a team. And we did that in about uh, a month, six weeks at the most. <laughs> we um, now have uh, 11 community engagement coordinators that are working across the state with over 170 community-based organizations who are doing outreach and community engagement, contact tracing, and wraparound support services for individuals in isolation and quarantine. Um, I think it's for me, um, listening to all of the panelists, I am an organizer, that's my background. And so I've always kind of thought, you know, when I got this opportunity, how am I going to fight the man from within the system? And of course, the best option is to give federal dollars to black and brown people. So I worked really hard to make sure that that's what we were doing. Um, and I think it's important to note that this is really um, new work for the public health division as far as community engagement. There are a lot of processes and procedures that we didn't create with community in mind. And so I've spent a lot of time saying it's too hard to get money to community. Why do we have all of this paperwork and rigmarole? Um, why, um, why does a CBO have to have an, a 501c3, why can't they have a fiscal sponsor? So someone mentioned um, me working on getting fiscal sponsorship earlier. We're really looking outside of the box because with the COVID response, we knew that community is going to do this work better. We have to give them the resources and tools to do this work, to talk to their community, to, to help, help build trust because we are, the state and the state of Oregon hasn't traditionally wanted black and brown people here. In fact, it was a law on the books. So I'm coming back at the state with, if we're truly engaged in doing this work, there are policies and, and procedures that we need to adjust to make sure that it's actually working for community. Um, and so, you know, as Solange says, I got a seat at the table. I, I have a big mouth. Um, I don't know that I have any power, uh, but I, whatever little bit of power I have, I'm, I'm leveraging for community because um, I think Jason mentioned it before, people want to know what's up with Rona. And, and that's my dad. And when my daddy calls me and says, you getting that shot? I need to be able to say confidently, I am going to get that shot because I want to kick it with you. And I want us to be able to grill and talk about whatever. And we can't do that right now. So if that if I got to get a shot so that we can do that again, then I'm going to do it. But I need community to feel across the board confident in that. And that's a huge challenge that OHA is going to be working on. And we are really looking at um, equity as the core of this work and how we can uplift community voice. So a big part of my job is siphoning back all the feedback that we're hearing from community to try to, to make the process better. Um, but I will say that it's only um, recently that I feel like we might be getting the tools that we really need to do this work. We have been working on a shoestring budget. Um, this last administration didn't really throw us much of a bone. Anyway, that was a long-winded response, Mandy. No, I love it. Um, 
a couple of things I'm interested in and you and, and talking about because you know, OHA, and for those who don't know, OHA is, is putting equity and putting race equity kind of in the front of the work they do. And, and I know, you know, there's history with systems and sometimes we don't always trust and believe that. And so I hope that people will stay engaged and hold us all doing that work accountable. Because um, that's, I think that's helpful, at least for me, it's helpful to be held accountable to do that work and to show that work forward. I'm interested, Dolly, because, you know, because of your experience in, in the work and, and several different layers of the work, are there things that you have learned already or probably already knew that are helpful for other folks or especially like counties and locales who want to fund, elevate, integrate, you know, mutual aid, if that's what it's called, or kind of traditional methodologies and interventions um, in a way that kind of haven't shown up because of policy and practice? So are there any things that you're kind of, like for instance, I know I was, a, you know, with the CARES Act funding, you know, the reporting procedures were, were pretty, were pretty simple and I appreciated that, right? It was kind of like, we need to know this and this. We don't need to know 15 pages worth of things. So I, I feel like I even saw some things show up um, that are often barriers um, for that being successful. Anything that resonates with you if you were to advise others? Well, I, would, I will point out that local public health is a huge partner for us and we couldn't do this work without local public health. They are working really hard and many local health departments across the state already had relationships with community partners. And I think part of what we're doing is we're, um, we're finding other community partners for local public health to engage with. Um, that might be a little bit outside of the box, like somebody's abuela in the church basement who, you know, is real sociable and knows everybody. She might be a good contact tracer. Um, so how can we leverage that within community? Who are those trusted people? And so I think OHA was able to add to that list for local public health, but um, I think other funders, and um, Daisy really spoke eloquently about wildfire. I can't um, agree more that that was probably the most challenging thing that I have done professionally um, to date was working both COVID and the wildfire um, and being on the call and listening to the mobile morgue daily counts and um, and knowing and hearing from, from staff on the ground doing community engagement work that there's entire towns that are gone and we need to do something now to get resources to community. It was humbling. And I think as um, we started understanding that as a state, like these FEMA dollars and all of this money that's supposedly coming, sorry, the mailman's outside, um, are, are like not coming anytime soon. And so when I would have organizations, print, when I would have organizations like um, United Way say, what do, what do we do? And I would say, give the money directly to community. And that is my message to you give the money directly to community. They know what to do, they know what they want. We just need to give the money to them. And in the case of wildfire, I knew United Way could give them that money faster for the gift cards, for diapers, for shoes, for the things that as the state, I'm still in bureau bureaucratic hell here. And as much as I wanna push, there are some processes that take forever. Um, so I think it's a, it's a matter of, understanding that there are some things at the state level that we're going to do, but nothing comes quickly. And so having other partners that can fund this work and support community and not have the rigor of mold, because you, you mentioned CARES dollars, there's lots of rules and things. I don't want to be telling people how to spend their money. I really don't. Um, and I've been working hard to build our program in a way that we don't have to t tell people how to spend their money. Um, but there's often restrictions for state and federal dollars. So having as few restrictions on your funds as possible. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the, the feedback that you get from community on how to, to make your program, your work better is invaluable. Um, and, and that's what I continue to take away as we support community in this way. Excellent, thank you. Dolly, is there, any, is there anything that you would like to ask? Because I know, again, I know the, the work you and your team have been doing nonstop, um, as well as everyone who's on the screen. Because uh, I do think the, 
accumulated, persistent, prolonged toxic stress that communities are experiencing. Uh, you know, some of you have heard me say, like, our models aren't built on that. Our models are like, prepare and respond. It's not the idea of ongoing, accumulated, persistent toxic stress. And so the idea that we have to be giving, um, giving and supporting while also filling ourselves up as individuals, as families, as communities, kind of all simultaneous is I think a different way. Typically we're like, we'll prepare and then the thing will happen and then we'll have a moment to restore and then we'll be ready for the next yeah. thing, you know? And I'm just wondering, do you have uh, any ask of these group? I mean, people here, like things that would be helpful or to, to your actual work? Um, I would, I would actually reframe it mm -hmm. and say, because I'm noticing mostly a panel of uh, people of color um, and I would argue that we're actually very um, used to toxic stress. It's, I think what COVID has done and in this last year has done is just make it more a part of my daily life. Um, and so I would ask, because I, I, I was thinking when you asked um, the, the gentleman that was on before what he, um, what brings him happiness. Um, and, and my first thought for myself was Animal Crossing. And, and, I, and I think that because I'm spending 40 to 60 hours a week working COVID, I'm, I'm spending 40 to 60 hours a week hearing community feedback about what, what's happening, how people are sick and hurting and struggling. And it's hard. And Animal Crossing allows me to like, pick cute outfits and decorate an island and it's mindless and I really it really brings me happiness so I I would ask of you all in that, that same question around what are you doing for self-care and taking care of yourself because I feel like that has been the key for me to get up and come back to work every day is that I set hard boundaries and um and I piss some people off, but I don't care because I need to take care of myself so that I can come back and do this work. So that would be my question. I feel like that's kind of the mic drop that most people need to hear. Um, you know, Trauma from Oregon does a lot of work and focus around kind of what we talk about in sense of workforce wellness, but it's so much bigger and complicated. And this needs to be something that we front and center, uh, especially those who are in community doing work for their community and which you don't get to turn it off at five o'clock, right? It's like um, oftentimes to figuring out how to, how to support and sustain that work. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap up a few thoughts and then Aaron, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. I, do you have, I think I'm throwing it over to you and tell me not to. Um, and I will open up for anybody who's got a last minute thought, but I, I, I wanted to come back to two things that I feel like I hear, heard this morning, I'm interested in how we continue to do the work as we move forward, is kind of Pender Hughes's the, the, the intergenerational work, right? How do we hold that in this work as well? And how do we think about that as we, as we look to the work happening in our communities and in the different ways it's happening? I want to I want to make a really important point that if you hear people use that phrase trauma informed care, and I know it's limited in all the ways, is that that this work for community by community from community is is the action of trauma informed care that and that doesn't always happen. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't happen under the guise of trauma informed care. And so that I I I, wa I want to be able to say that and then hold us accountable to making sure that we're continuing to do that. I mean, if you look at the principles of trauma informed care, collaboration, mutual self help, peer support, right, sharing leadership, all of those things are embedded in this idea of you know, what is trauma-informed or trauma-informed approach or practice. Um, Pender Hughes, I don't know that Pender Hughes said this today, Dr. Pender Hughes, when he was talking, but in his work, he, he, he calls for, he talks about regular positive community engagement, regular positive community engagement. And in, in a lot of the work we do around community resilience in response to climate disasters is the idea that you can't wait till the disaster happens. Like you gotta build that fabric of community it kind of whether it's in between, right? But I mean, it's not. It's not just like let's do it to respond and repair. Let's do it all the time. And and I think I said earlier, I encourage you to look at the state health improvement plan because I think you'll see a lot of the strategies are around cultural festivals, cultural events, right? Murals, the things that start to that are the in between moments of connecting people. I'm interested in how we do that again. You heard me this morning talk about how do we let people connect um, in a way that's safe 
and, and heal in the identities in which people feel like that needs work needs to happen in the service of, but not maybe quickly, like give time for that. So I, so I, I think of that regular positive community engagement and I think of all the work you all have talked about today and it's, it is like, that's that work, right? And so I'm really interested in asking people to think about as you move forward, what's happening in your community? Like, do you know who's doing the work in your community? What do you do to support it? Um, I know there was a question and we don't have time right now, hopefully we will, but um, later in a conversation, but also how do you support and get out of the way, right? How can I contribute my funds and not tell you what to do with it, right? How can, how can we, so constantly be kind of challenging yourself. And I'm saying that as a white person, right? Like how do I, in my own community, do that work? And so thinking about uh, how we then also, I'm really interested, I think in order to respond to things like COVID-19, to um, ongoing climate disasters and what falls out of those things. So there's a fire, after the fire, there's a flood, right? So how, um, how do we, hold the space to bring all the, integrate these things without co-opting it. It's kind of what I'm just sitting with constantly. I'm always the worst person to sum anything up because I just add 20 more questions. I just want to know more, I'm like try more, right? So I'm super grateful that you all are sharing your experiences from on the ground level to state level to kind of policy level to just getting water in trucks and driving it to people level, right? And so I think it'll be interesting to see how we keep, we keep flowing through this. Um, before I keep rambling with a thousand other questions to offer the world, uh, Anna or Aaron, do you want to? Okay, there's Anna. I'll yeah, uh, we just want to do some shout outs uh, as, a, as a way to extend our deepest gratitude. And part of that will be remaining in connection with each other. So, um, yeah, deep sense of gratitude to Howard from UCSF and uh, AJ. Such a pleasure to meet you this way uh, versus the phone calls from Equitable Giving Star Call. Jamie from Mom's Block, uh, thanks so much for being here even when you're sick. Uh, Jason, uh, what a storyteller and a lover. We so appreciate you from Fires Igniting the Spirit. Uh, Daisy from Picoon, uh, you, you were a, a, a gem uh, both now and also when we talked, you uh, highly informed this process. I'm so grateful for our connection. Uh, super grateful for Andrew of the Fingers Crossing Interpreting and Andrew's uh, colleague Risa uh, for providing a cell interpreting. Uh, Dolly England from OHA, thank you for being here and taking the time to connect in this way. Um, your efforts are very noteworthy. Uh, Gita of PSU and Aaron of uh, the Collective Action Consulting, thank you. Thank you both for holding the um, uh, space for the panelists. And uh, thank you to David and Pei for uh, holding the AV support uh, from PSU. And I would like to thank uh, Mandy and Cleo, whose face you don't see here, but Cleo was instrumental in making all of this work and moving some resources from one hand to another uh, in order to make this happen. So both Mandy and Cleo of TIO. Um, yeah, uh, stay connected with each other, stay connected with us. We'll make this recording available as soon as we can. And in the chat box, I will put a survey. Uh, Trauma-Informed Oregon is very interested in continuing to hear your input and in where we put our resources, our thought, our energy uh, in the coming years. So if you're interested in uh, informing uh, what we do for the uh, next two to five years, please uh, fill out the survey. We would really appreciate it. All right, y'all. Thank you, everyone.